Well, you know, five years ago, I was sitting in my cottage in Scotland, which is in the borders, which incidentally is about um, two and a half hours drive from where the story takes place in Andrews. And I got a phone call while I was sitting in the cottage from an, uh, uh, an American producer called Jim Kreutzer. And he'd bought the rights to the book. There's a book that came out in 2007 called um, Tommy's Honor. And, and it was written by Kevin Cook. And um, it told the entire story. And I remember sitting and reading it in one sitting. And uh, it's a, an amazing story um, all about Tom Morris and his son, Tommy Morris. But really, ostensibly, it's about a period of time um, the, uh, what would be considered the, the beginning of the new era of golf. At that time, there were only 13 rules of golf. Uh, now there's about 5,000, so it was certainly uh, different. And, and, and again, that was something that was, I was hugely drawn to because it's the beginning, and therefore, uh, you know, they carried their clubs. And uh, one of the rules was that you teed off no more than a club length from where the hole was. So Tom would spend so long trying to get the greens right and then guys would put the ball down a club length away and then smack the ball from there and churn up his greens. Um, um, but the other side of the story that was really compelling to me outside of the golf was the family drama and, and the love story, uh, one between young Tommy and his uh, wife Meg and also uh, the family drama in the Morris household uh, between the father and son ostensibly but also the mother, Nancy. And um, there was multi-layered, the story, because you have uh, the whole upper and lower class scenario at that time, and then also uh, how, how powerful religion and the church was in their society. So there were many things to look at, and I felt like the story was universal in, in, in its appeal. Um, and these guys were extraordinary uh, golfers in their own right, and um, certainly Tommy was uh, extraordinary prestigious I mean he he won the uh, first open uh, at 17 and then won it three times in a row kept the belt which uh, that was part of the, the the rules and they had nothing to play for in the in the fourth year and so they he didn't play, they didn't have a British Open in the, and then they got a cup which is now the famous claret jug and his name is the first name on the claret jug his father won it four times, and his father's the oldest. So they bookend each other like that. And Tommy had an extraordinary life, was it was a real shooting star, and ultimately uh, uh, had a, a very tragic uh, end to his life, uh, which I won't reveal too much more about because uh, you have to go and see the film. Yeah. The crowd at that time were absolutely viscerally right next to the players and they were shouting and they were gambling and they were drinking and they were smoking and you know they had this energy and vitality it is a very different type of game and it's wonderful to be able to show the beginnings of something and how it where it's gone to i mean there's 70 million people that play golf it's a very polarizing game people love it or they hate it um but it um you know and they, these men had no sense of their own legacy and they uh they created something that people should know about I've been an actor as well as a director, and I had had um, uh, the happy adventurer, uh, which it, it, it always is, working with Peter Mullen. Um, he was playing a sort of magical, mystical magician in the in the television show I did called Shoebox Zoo, a children's television show, and I was playing the father of the the lead girl. And I only had a couple of scenes with Peter, but even in those, um, I recognise that he was he's such a fantastic actor and very relaxed and very different to how one might envisage him because <clears throat> he's actually lovely and talks and tells stories and is a joy to have on set. Um, uh, ironically, because often he plays very dark, broody characters. And I just remember when we started to hone the script, when we started to really work on with the writers, I thought, wow, you know, Peter Mullen to play old Tom would be absolutely perfect. And to his credit, I rang him, and I couldn't understand quite why he was sounding so groggy. And then I found out he was actually in New Zealand. It was 4 o'clock in the morning for him. So that was slightly embarrassing. But he, he, he was great about it. And I said, look, I've got this script. I've been working really hard on it. I'd love you to read it. I'd love you to play old Tom. He knew nothing about the story of the Morris family. Uh, he'd never played golf. Um, and he read it, and he called me the next day, and he said, if you want me, I'm in. And that was the beginning of... The process and you always 
you know, when you're casting things, I'm casting at the moment for another project, you know, you, you really need someone to step up like that and then it starts to, to fall into place. Um, Jack Loudon, um, continually working now, wonderful actor, um, really, the, they are wonderful together and their chemistry uh, was one because of their talent but also luck because I just think they really hit it off and, and really enjoyed each other. Ironically I was in America and I Skyped with him and he's quite serious and intense but when he laughs and when he gets enthused uh, it just uh, you know jumps from every pore and, and, and they really are wonderful together and so as we built the cast to have those two in place, and then Ophelia, a lover bond, who's wonderful as, as Meg, um, Therese Bradley, who plays uh, Nancy, the wife of Tom, uh, you know, the, the, Peter Ferdinando, uh, and of course Sam Neill, who everybody will know from Jurassic Park and, and various other shows. Um, yeah, lovely. And what was wonderful is I started acting in Perth Rep up in Scotland. And so I was able to ring people that I hadn't seen or had seen, you know, but had worked with 35 years earlier and invite them to come and be in the film. The, uh, the, the, one of the caddies with the big top hat, um, who's wonderful in the film, Andy Gray, uh, you know, I've known since I was 19. So it was wonderful to have friendly faces. I'm enormously proud of, of many aspects of the film, you know, um, obviously, I don't. I didn't do all of of the things in the film. There's wonderful acting, and there's costumes, makeup, uh, all the different elements. But the fact that one is able to hopefully galvanize everyone to to make something that other people could be taken uh, to that world. And you know, for me, the 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 highest praise is when people who see the film feel as though they were there, that they were in it. Um, my thing about period about uh, movies, about sport movies, about uh, family dramas, is <clears throat> I don't want people to feel as though they were outside looking in. The hardships really of the film uh, were logistical as far as uh, how many days we had to shoot. Um, we shot in 33 days the whole movie and we had 50 locations. So we were moving at a pace and so everybody needed to be on their game. and. Uh, and they were, and we never went over a day, and we never went over budget. So in that sense, uh, that feels good. And we hopefully were able to create something uh, that will... I mean, the wonderful thing about a period movie is it doesn't age. So hopefully it will play for a, for a long time. Um.